As we look back in time at what our world was, what it has become, and where it's headed, one undeniable conclusion springs to mind. We seem to be at war with nature, both internally and externally. The fad of relativism, so aggressively propped up by academia, tells us that all is subjective, all is artificial construct and man-made label. There's essentially nothing real and true. Any opinion of how to live and be is as valid and potentially healthy as the next. However, the natural world, in its quiet, eternal wisdom, sits patiently as a powerful rebuke to this pretentiously deceptive wordplay. A template of such masterful complexity, operating in perfect balance and harmony, self-propagating, self-refining and improving, always adapting and creating, an echo and reflection of its creator, a shadow of God insofar as we're able to grasp and understand it. When searching for cues on how to be, on how to best navigate the world around us, there is no better blueprint. And what does nature tell us? It speaks of the importance of order and organization, structure, of immutable laws that govern everything in the universe, from the macro to the micro. A glance at the animal kingdom and those creatures most like us shows us the importance of well-constituted, merit-based hierarchies. Also, the immense importance of hormones and the fundamental role of estrogen and testosterone in helping shape these hierarchies, as well as determining fitness in mate selection. Finally, nature informs us that creation is the ultimate goal. Self-propagation, recreating ourselves into new and slightly different forms. Any species that turns its back on this universal law commits suicide by so doing, and thereby proves itself unworthy of continued existence. Our age is being indoctrinated into denying this aspect of our true nature, and the outright war being waged on the masculine and feminine is one of the best examples of this. Throughout most of recorded history, the type of men who rose to positions of power and influence were those that gave off signals of health and good breeding, signals we intuitively pick up on to varying degrees. A good posture, confident and noble bearing, a calmness and steadiness of character and action, men who could lead an army on a battlefield, throw a spear or javelin, or engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat just as easily as they could converse with the greatest minds of their day. The Latin saying, mens sana in corpus sano, was accepted as the most obvious truth in all ages prior to our own. We recognized that there was real value to the shaping of perspective and worldview in being a balanced human being, not neglecting any area of development and recognizing they all play a role in the creation of a well-adjusted personality. Feminine grace and beauty were considered innate gifts granted from on high and chastity as something sacred and valuable. For the most powerful examples of this archetype, men were more than willing to fight and die. Such women were the muse underlying many of the greatest expeditions, works of art, acts of bravery and self-sacrifice. Men viewed this mysterious feminine nature with great awe and respect. It was a single woman, Helen of Troy, that stands as the principal figure and cause of what may be the most formative single event in Western history, the fall of Troy, an event that has shaped our psyche in profound ways extending up to the present day. Instead of recognizing the unique value and strengths of these two energies and respecting their interplay as one of the foremost energy-producing dynamics underlying all of nature, we've witnessed them being caricatured, mocked and demeaned, and finally denied entirely. Instead of embracing them as complementary forces in a symbiotic relationship, helping to infuse the world with a positive tension, a spirit, energy, we're being taught to view them as adversarial, as if we were engaged in some petty us-versus-them struggle. 
what was formerly a reciprocal dance has now become a pitched battle. This is heartbreaking to watch. We have feminist movements in which a significant percentage of adherents believe men to be the foremost problem, preventing a better world from taking shape. We have movements like MGTOW, which essentially see women as the foremost problem. For those forces seeking to use divide and conquer tactics to further their own ends, the toxic atmosphere created between males and females in our age certainly ranks amongst their greatest successes. Divided into warring camps, the positive tension becomes negative tension, and the harmony is destroyed and replaced with chaos and dissipated energy. In concert with the directing of these natural energies against one another, we're witnessing a push to destroy them entirely. Whether by coincidence or design, the past few decades witnessed the most extreme changes in hormonal balance in human history. In a very real sense, men are no longer men, women no longer women. And this development is universally pushed as hip, as the new ideal. No more proton and electron, yin and yang, black and white, but rather endless variations of tired gray. Deep down, on an intuitive and primal level, we know something is very wrong. Divorce rates skyrocket, poll after poll indicate we're less happy and secure in relationships. Sex and relationships in general become less meaningful as we free fall from the sacred to the profane, with confusion acting as our gravity. When all becomes relative, all becomes chaos and uncertainty, meaningless and unimportant. And once again, all of this is contagious, we now exist in a world so deeply interconnected that one individual's sickness has a butterfly effect rippling out to infect the entire organism. We're all pulled down into the collective muck to varying degrees. This is a very new sickness. At no other point in our history as a species have we fallen so far from a natural view of the world and our place within it. So how did this happen? And how do we turn the tide? As with so many of the unnatural recent changes in culture and worldview, much of this can be traced back to the Frankfurt School and a certain brand of intellectualism that managed to worm its way into academia, establish an initial foothold, and proceed to monopolize it by exclusively promoting like minds through the ranks over the span of decades. The goal of these men was to completely destroy the very foundations of thousands of years of Indo-European civilization. They seemed to care little about what was created in its place, if anything. The main focus seemed to be destruction. Pull back for a moment and contemplate the enormity of this. Thousands of years of an unbroken chain of building upon the foundations of our ancestors attempting to retain what worked best and discard all that didn't through countless tweaks and refinements over generations, created a culture, a moral and ethical structure and traditions, which helped us live more ordered, structured, happy, healthy, and efficient lives. The goal of these self-proclaimed intellectuals was to lay waste to all of this as quickly and completely as humanly possible. This is no exaggeration or mischaracterization. This was the stated aim of their philosophy, if one can even call it that. Assuming you're lucky enough to have been well-raised and provided with a healthy start in life by loving and caring parents, you may be asking yourself, why? What would the impulse be to engage in such behavior? This is the instinctive reaction of every well-constituted soul, incapable of recognizing how those at the polar opposite end of the spectrum of psychological health think and operate. In my view, there are two potential answers here. The first is that this destruction is willful, purposeful, with some enterprising, parasitic souls recognizing that the only way to dominate and control nations perhaps even the world at large, is to destroy their roots and foundations, sever everything that makes them strong, confident, 
allows them to plant their feet and feel secure. To create a breed of mindless, consumerist cogs in a machine, one would need to destroy their love and respect for their own fundamental nature, and cause them to embrace the unnatural as modern, as progress. The other option is that this destruction wasn't willful or purposeful, but rather a collection of parasitic souls living out their own archetype. Picture a lost and unhealthy drug addict, consumed with self-loathing, pushing one of his few remaining friends to try his drug of choice. Not fully recognizing his urge to do so was spurred on by wanting to see his friend fall to the same depths as he. To eliminate that vast chasm between them that acts as a constant reminder of his sick condition. To have additional company in the depths. Now picture this happening on a macro level. Regardless of the why, the how is a bit easier to definitively trace with some clarity. For decades, we've been confronted with only the most negative portrayals of masculinity and femininity. Instead of highlighting the courage, that sense of loyalty and honor, and those countless generations of men who proved willing to fight and die for their nations and ideals, or the stoic self-sacrifice of a husband and father working his hands to the bone to provide a better life for his children than his own parents were able to provide for him, were instead presented with an image of masculinity as the root of unjust treatment of the weak at the hands of the strong, or the sneering and hateful demeaning of women, the hollering at a TV screen during football season with beer in hand. We've lost the conception of the elegant and graceful feminine the intuitive empath that selflessly acts as the glue binding the family together. The imperturbable rock helping to make both husband and family into better and stronger people. Prevailing culture has told a generation of girls that their value lies in pursuing dollars to buy things, and has thus belittled the most important occupation of them all, the molding and shaping of future generations, the literal creation and cultivation of healthy and happy human beings through informed and loving motherhood. In the world of entertainment that so helps shape our conception of reality, we've lost our Marlon Brando, Mel Gibson, and Clint Eastwood archetypes, and had them replaced first with Archie Bunker and Al Bundy, then Homer Simpson and Peter Griffin, and then whatever this is. Our Audrey Hepburn and Grace Kelly replaced with Gloria Steinem, then Madonna, leading to whatever this is. Put simply, we created artificial societal frameworks within which we're forced to act contrary to our natures as human beings, or suffer the myriad of consequences that spring from being out of touch with the times. We allowed our cultural stream to be hijacked and rerouted, and now look on helplessly as it swiftly carries us in a very dangerous direction. To any subscribers to the MGTOW ideology that may be listening, I fully understand and sympathize with your exasperation. Women in the Western world are the foremost targets of this cultural Marxist poison, and it shows more and more with each passing year. We live in challenging times. The question is, how do we handle this challenge? Do we raise the white flag, give up on our women, and act as if every last one of them is unsalvageable? Keeping them at arm's length and treating them with detached coldness or disdain? Or do we do all we can to rise to the challenge and right the ship? To seek out the exceptions to the rule in an individual context, and then strive to live in a manner that displays the merits of a healthier worldview. If nature is our ultimate guide, how could one possibly deny the importance of finding an ideal mate and thereby seeking to create new life? To females exasperated by man-children and the phenomenon of soy-swilling new males, so celebrated by our controlled media and entertainment industries, again resist the urge to believe there aren't hundreds of thousands of exceptions to this modern rule. Examples of healthy masculinity, 
or at least those striving towards this goal, who are probably just as actively searching for you as you're searching for them. Nobody is perfect, and we've all been ingesting the same poisons to various degrees, so patience is a virtue here. Ideally, we'd learn to help guide one another back out of this chaotic labyrinth we've stumbled into, and back towards the direction of adopting healthy masculine and feminine archetypes. Not only for one another's sake, but as examples for future generations. And this brings me to my final point, one that may be controversial and cause anger in certain circles, but I can assure you doesn't come from a place of hatred or ill will, quite the opposite. In the collective rush to embrace this new fad that we're told marks us out as good people, as tolerant, progressive, hip, modern, it seems we've given little thought to how such attitudes are affecting children a lack of discussions on the ramifications of raising a child in a home without a healthy male and a healthy female influence, and how this might affect their mental development. I'd encourage everyone to ask themselves this question. When it comes to my own child's well-being, do I trust the example put forth by nature and the ideas subscribed to throughout the entirety of human history up until a few decades ago? or the ideas of a small handful of men who call themselves intellectuals, whose goals, according to their own words, are to destroy order, structure, culture, and tradition. It's one thing to experiment with our own lives. It's a very different thing entirely to gamble with the mental health and well-being of future generations. And I can't shake the notion that such a gamble borders on child abuse in many cases. At present, things may be far from ideal, and among that subset of the population dragged further downward with the passage of time, by those manipulative Pied Pipers that call the tune of popular culture, things are getting far worse. At the same time, there is more reason than ever to feel optimism. As a reaction to this increase in degenerative chaos, millions are embracing their roots and traditions and learning once again to prize the wisdom of those that came before us. A wisdom, I happen to believe, stretches back to the highest wisdom of all. I'm confident there's a new dawn on the horizon. As our clarity improves and we're increasingly able to recognize and expunge the poison in our system. As we learn to become genuine men and women again, to recognize and respect that masculine and feminine nature within us, I look forward to the day in which we put down our weapons and cease to battle, and in its stead, once again resume that eternal, life-affirming dance. <laughs>